the queen stepped before her mirror and said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who in this land is fairest of all? The mirror answered, You, my queen, are fair, it is true. But Snow White, beyond the mountains with the seven dwarfs, is still a thousand times fairer than you. From the Language App Battle, this is Multilinguish. I'm David Duchin. You've likely heard about the Brothers Grimm before, those famous German story collectors whose folk tales have stood the test of time. Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, a lot of the Disney classics you probably grew up watching are based on those very stories. Digging deeper into the history of the work of the Grimm's is about more than just reading fairy tales, however. It's about exploring their connection to their people and their language in the way that they defined a nation. We're going to spend the first part of this episode talking about the folk tales the Grimm brothers compiled, because that's what they're most known for. But after the break, we'll dive more into their work in Germanic linguistics. Throughout the episode, we'll get a feel for how their work as language scholars was intertwined with the current of the time, or the zeitgeist. Before we get started, make sure to rate and review Multilinguish wherever you listen. And don't forget to subscribe so you get new episodes as soon as they're released. Joining me is my fellow content producer, Thomas Devlin. Hi, Thomas. Hi, David. So, Thomas, I thought you'd be a great addition to this episode because you've written a little bit about the Brothers Grimm for Babel magazine. And just like me, you studied linguistics and have probably at least heard about these guys and their contributions to the field of language studies. Yeah, so I wrote a short article for the Babel magazine about the Brothers Grimm, but I really do have to give a shout out to my favorite website, JSTOR, for turning me on to the topic because, like... I'm pretty sure most American children, and I'm sure children in a lot of countries, I know the Brothers Grimm from like the original fairy tales and such, but I really didn't know until I read this article about how they worked a lot in the linguistics field as well. And I didn't dive too much into the topic, so I'm looking forward to learning more here now. Yeah, and I want to hear your reflections too, as someone who has dabbled in understanding a bit about them and their work, but doesn't necessarily know everything. Uh, Not that I know everything either, but I have done a lot of research about these guys. I think they're really cool. I wrote a paper about them and their work in college uh, for a German history class, but because they do so much work in linguistics and I studied linguistics too, just like you, I feel like there's a lot of overlap um, with so many different fields that I uh, was learning a lot about in school. So I'm excited for this episode. I think there's a lot to learn and our listeners will really like it too. But before we get into the folktales section, let's talk about a little biography about who the Brothers Grimm actually are. So I'll give you a little context, um, who they are, what kind of work that they were doing, and the kind of the feeling and the political history of the time, because that's important to understanding the work that the brothers were trying to accomplish and the implications that it had on not only German culture, but literature and language of the time. So the brothers Grimm, uh, die Bruder Grimm, you might say in German, were born in the town of Hanau in Germany. So Jakob is the older brother, Jakob Grimm, uh, spelled just like Jacob. He was born in 1785, and Wilhelm is the younger of the two, and he was born in 1786. So Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm. And the family grew up with four younger siblings. So they had a pretty well-off family, didn't really want for much. Um, They moved from the town of Hanau to Steinau a couple years after they were both born. Uh, But after the death of their father, they kind of fell more into poverty. They had to resort to living a more frugal lifestyle. And this is something that shaped their perspective and view of the world and the, the Germany around them as they moved through their adolescence. So one thing that they are known for is having a really strong bond with each other and also with the art of storytelling itself. So a lot of historians and authors will reference what they call their collector spirit, this idea that they were always searching for and sharing stories with each other, with their community. And this um, this collector spirit was something that really um, inspired them to connect the, the, quote, lore and language of childhood, as some historians would put it, with what would eventually be the collection of folktales that they put together. And not only that, but also some of the work they did around Germanic linguistics, which we'll talk about in just a bit. So like I said, 
after the death of their father, they they moved um, to graduate from grade school, uh, just like normal boys would do at the time. And then they attended the University of Marburg to study law. Keep in mind, let's talk about um, what's kind of happening in, in Germany at the time around them. Because the idea of Germany as we know today, as a, a unified political entity, one country, didn't exist at all in the same way. So this kind of Germany that we see today once existed as a, an amalgamation, a combination of hundreds of principalities and monarchies, really, really small states that all had their own independent rulers, um, kings, whatever, that all had different standards and ways of ruling. And this meant that from the Middle Ages to the Habsburg Empire, to the reign of Napoleon at the beginning of the 18th century, there are pushes for people to come together as Germans who speak the same language and often have the same culture to recognize their shared ancestry and the, and the ties that brought them together. Um, even though they were divided by these these sort of arbitrary political boundaries that had existed for quite some time, for hundreds of years, there is a movement that's also spurred by romanticism and the rise of um, kind of a creative spirit on the continent um, at the end of the 1700s and early 1800s um, that people are, are starting to feel, okay, why is it that we are separated by these boundaries when we are ultimately, at the end of the day, the same people. So it was a fractured and fragmented sort of political landscape, but the the Brothers Grimm are, are growing up in a time where people are starting to, to buy into these, these greater trends towards unification. Germany as a whole wasn't unified as a country till the later 1800s, but these currents had been kind of making their way through um, the German political discourse for some time. You know, with the reign of Napoleon, a lot of French language and culture has been encroaching on them from the outside. And a lot of people, just like the Grimm's, are saying, well, what makes us uniquely German? We look at this outside culture that's seeping in, and it's not us, it's not ours, but what is ours? What is, what is inherently German? So... A lot of the work that the Grimm's do is influenced by these questions. And uh, that leads them when they're older to become a group or a part of a group called the Göttingen Seven. So there's a town called Göttingen in Germany with a university where the brothers were um, professors. And they were a part of a group of seven professors that advocated for s civil liberties and basic human rights and freedoms, which sometimes landed them in political hot water. We don't really have to talk a lot about that, um, but just know that they were really fierce, strong advocates for political rights for um, all people, and especially the working people that they had grown up around and come to know really well. Okay, so Thomas, does that sort of set the scene for you about what's going on and in informing um, what we're going to talk about next, which is the, the famous folk tales of the Grimm brothers? Yeah, that is uh, a lot of information. Uh, I knew a little bit about how Germany was kind of the splintered place, but uh, it's a complicated country because I feel like so many times when I hear the history of countries, it's just kind of like they focus on like one city and then that is where everything grew out from. But Germany kind of took a bunch of different identities in the same area and molded them together in a way that seems different from a lot of European history. Yeah, it seems like German history is very unique in that the German, the idea of a German people, the folk, as they might call it, um, is has always kind of been there, but the the political realities didn't always reflect that. So that's kind of what I want to emphasize is that Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm are growing up in a time where they speak the same language as their neighbors and they have much of the same culture as the people who are spread throughout this region, what we know today as Germany, but it doesn't exist as a unified Germany yet. Okay, so we've kind of laid the groundwork for understanding what's going on at the time in the early um, to mid 1800s. Now let's talk about the most re recognizable work that the Grimm's produced, which is their famous fairy tale collection. Uh, it's called 
the Kinder und Hausmärchen, so Kinder, children, and und, house, household, Märchen, are fairy tales or folk tales. So children and household tales, they first published uh, the first edition in 1812, but there were seven subsequent editions uh, and revisions that came through that period until 1857. So this is something that they're working on consistently from the moment they start until, you know, some 45 years later. This is the classic Grimm's fairy tales book. When people reference the Grimm's fairy tales, this is what they're talking about, Kinder und Hausmärchen and all of its editions. It has become one of the most famous and most widely distributed book in Germany, second only to the Bible. So that's giving you an idea for how popular it really is. So many of the stories that you probably heard growing up were originally Grimm's fairy tales that could be found in these books. Cinderella, Snow White, Little Red Riding Hood, Rumpelstiltskin, and the list goes on. Most fairy tales that you would think of probably existed in some form in in uh, the first or second or third editions of Kinder und Hausmärchen. You might have heard of the Grimm's traveling throughout the country to collect these stories, and that's exactly what they did. So when they needed to fill in gaps, they took some creative liberties, but mostly they published the stories in their unfiltered and unvarnished forms, the ones that they got directly from the people that they were sourcing them from, um, whether they were neighbors or friends of their younger sister or people that were referred to them from people they worked with in their university. Um, they were collecting these stories from the mouths of actual storytellers um, who had been passing down this oral tradition for generations and and putting them directly on the page. Only 12, 12 of the 86 tales that appeared in the first volume, which was published in 1812, came from literary sources, which means that the vast majority came straight from the mouths of people themselves. So it shows there was an immense amount of time and thought that went into the brothers gathering of oral tradition from actual human sources. So this idea that we have this kind of romantic vision of the brothers traveling throughout the countryside and gathering these stories is very much true. Um, they wanted to, to actually access people directly and hear um, and find stories that weren't, you know, like published in books and had been edited and um, altered over the course of many different publications. It's it's things that are actually coming from from the mouths of mothers who tell these stories to their children, for example. So we are familiar with a lot of these folk tales because mostly what we've heard is their modern, often Americanized, or what I'm going to call the Disney-fied forms. But the stories that children grew up hearing weren't often the same that we know. They weren't always as squeaky clean or as G-rated. So Thomas, do you want to hear a little bit of an excerpt from one of the Grimm's stories um, that was published way, way back before we even knew um, the American version? Absolutely. So a lot of us know the story of the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. In the story, the Disney story, the movie that many of us have seen, the evil stepmother asks her magic mirror who is the fairest of them all and it tells her that it's snow white so she is jealous of snow white's beauty and she actually sends her away to be killed by a hunter and asks for her heart in return as proof that she's truly dead so it is a little gruesome already um but keep in mind that this is a movie that lasts hours there's a lot of details um that are you know a lot of extra song and and dance and flashiness and color um, that we wouldn't get in the original Grimm story. So listen to this English translation of the original folktale that's found in the Grimm's collection. The queen took fright and turned yellow and green with envy. From that hour on, whenever she looked at Snow White, her heart turned over inside her body. So great was her hatred for the girl. The envy and pride grew even greater, like a weed in her heart until she had no peace day and night. Then she summoned the huntsman and said to him, take Snow White out into the woods. I never want to see her again. Kill her, and as proof that she is dead, bring her lungs and her liver back to me. The huntsman obeyed and took Snow White into the woods. He took out his hunting knife and was about to stab it into her innocent heart when she began to cry saying, Oh dear huntsman, let me live. I will run into the wild woods and never come back. <laughs> 
because she was so beautiful, the huntsman took pity on her and said, Run away, you poor child. He thought, the wild animals will soon devour you anyway. But still, it was as if a stone had fallen from his heart, for he would not have to kill her. Just then, a young boar came running by. He killed it, cut out its lungs and liver, and took them back to the queen as proof of Snow White's death. The cook had to boil them with salt, and the wicked woman ate them supposing that she had eaten Snow White's lungs and liver. So this story that you just heard is obviously a bit different compared to the story told from the Disney perspective. The whole eating the lungs and liver thing is probably not something that would fly in the Disney version. Um, and in this story too, you didn't hear it in the excerpt, but the prince who saves Snow White comes across her while she's still lying lifeless in her coffin, her glass coffin that the dwarves have put her in. And upon learning her story from the seven dwarves, the prince gets permission from them to transport her unconscious body with him because he can't bear to not look at her now that he's seen her and become familiar with her. So this is these are details that I'm sure the writers at Disney wanted to kind of tweak or alter here and there. Um, some stuff that's pretty creepy that might scare children, even though the story as a whole is generally the same. We notice a couple differences and we also notice that the story from the Grimm's progresses much, much faster, whereas in a movie like Snow White, which lasts for many, many minutes over an hour, there's a lot that's been added, um, a lot of details that we don't find in the original story. So what do you think, Thomas? What stands out to you as something that sets apart the Grimm's story from maybe the Disney, the Disney story or another Americanized version that you've heard? Yeah, it's been quite a while since I've watched Snow White and the Seven Dwarves particularly. I know it was a feat of animation when it came out. And you do have to wonder what's running through the animators' minds when they're like, this story that mentions blood and guts will make a great, great children's film. Um, because I think that, more than anything else, is what speaks to me. I do think there are still some creepy elements in Disney versions sometimes. Like, isn't Sleeping Beauty the one where like he's still kisses an unconscious body yeah and that makes you wonder like who was making the decision to to either change that detail from the grim story or or keep it in um but yeah they the disney versions aren't entirely free of these kind of more disturbing elements um but it seems like if anything the disney versions are just much more embellished and they're drawn out and there's a lot more room for creative license it seems whereas the Grimm's kind of the story from the Grimm's reads very much like a like a cut and dry here's the plot here's what happened and we're not going to try to to make it child friendly necessarily yeah definitely needs more music uh in my opinion so there's another Grimm story too you may have heard of this one it's generally regarded as one of the most disturbing out there so it doesn't have a Disney counterpart as far as I'm aware it's called The Robber Bridegroom. It's a fairly short tale about a woman who has a sinking feeling that the man she's engaged to in a sort of arranged marriage, um, there's some, that there's something wrong. So in the story, the groom or the groom-to-be requests that the young bride, the main character, ventures out into the dark forest to come to his house for the first time, where she's never been. And when she gets there, an old woman who is at the house warns her to turn back because she's in a murderer's den. So the young bride hides behind a barrel right before a group of men, including her groom-to-be, returns to the house. And here's what happens next. This had scarcely happened when the godless band came home. They were dragging with them another maiden. They were drunk and paid no attention to her screams and sobs. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full, one glass of white, one glass of red and one glass of yellow, which caused her heart to break. Then they ripped off her fine clothes, laid her on a table, chopped her beautiful body in pieces and sprinkled salt on it. The poor bride behind the barrel trembled and shook, for she saw well what fate the robbers had planned for her. Okay, Thomas, what is your reaction to this one? Um, I'd say I'm a gog. I didn't expect it to be quite so intense 
because I feel like an important rite of passage when you're a child is you go through like your Edgar Allan Poe like goth phase when you realize like oh the grim stories are darker than you imagine and in like Cinderella they were much crueler to her than in the movie but uh this one definitely takes it to a different level yeah this is certainly a lot more disturbing than anything I would recognize from a Disney movie that I watched growing up I mean this one even in these two um three four sentences however however long it is there's bodily dismemberment cannibalism all that stuff so this is one of those tales where it's like okay clearly this can't just be made into a movie Uh, if i were an an executive at disney at the time i would just not even touch this one with a 10-foot pole um this is not exactly the message that i'd want to send to children but i think the important thing to keep in mind here is that the Grimm brothers are preserving stories that are passed down from generations as they've been told and they're not sparing the gruesome or grisly details here do you agree yeah uh, and I have to imagine, like, this wasn't, we think of these as children's stories, but, like, I'm sure there are adults telling these. Like, I feel like the most disturbing aspect is just thinking about telling this to a child, but that's not really the point. Yeah, and I wonder how many children did end up hearing these. Just, I mean, if, you, if you're if you an adult with a, a good story in your arsenal, then if your child asks for a bedtime story, this might be the one that you pull out. I'm not sure. Would you, David? I don't know. I'm not I'm not living in 19th century Germany, so I can't tell you what I would do if my young son said, Daddy, read me a bedtime story or tell me a bedtime story. And what if this was the only one I could think of? I don't know. Or what if what if German children at the time just ha- could stomach this sort of thing without batting an eye? What if they were less afraid than the child of today? You never know. I'm sure there's some of that because there's the whole like... I mean, children at that time definitely had to deal with death on a more personal basis. Like, that's very much kept from children these days. It's impossible to talk about this without sounding like a scold about how children are wimps, but there's definitely a change. Like, I wouldn't let a child hear this now, but maybe they'd be fine. Well, maybe you should recruit a local child that you know and tell him or her the story and see what the reaction is. Is that a good idea? Yeah, next episode, (laughs) we traumatize (laughs) child. All right, Thomas, I'll leave that to you. Um, Please report back. Um, One thing I'd like to highlight before we um, kind of summarize and wrap up this section before the break is that in the seven editions that were published of this collection of tales, Kinder und Hausmärchen, between 1812 and 1857, a lot of these stories are saturated with proverbs that came not from the fancy literary speech that you would expect from a really seasoned writer who's making a lot of edits and has a a lot of time to fine tune his or her story. But a lot of the, the language and proverbs are coming from the colloquial language and speech of the common folk as the Grimm's collected them. So for example, in a story called the wolf and the seven kids, the kids skip around their mother quote, like a tailor at his wedding when they're cut out of the wolf's stomach. And that's an often used expression from the period, like a tailor at his wedding. And in the story Rumpelstiltskin, which a lot of us will probably recognize, the title character's house, Rumpelstiltskin's house, is situated, quote, where the fox and the hare say goodnight to each other. So that's also an expression that you'd hear in contemporary everyday German speech of the time, things that parents would say to their children, and that would have meaning and would be be said a lot. So that's just one thing I think it's important to note, that the stories themselves contain insights into kind of the language and the everyday common speech that you'd hear from from laymen and people in the community um telling these stories just you know not trying to to make their speech sound um filtered or altered in any way so it's i think it's a cool window into kind of what was going on in germany at the time linguistically okay so Let's take a second and just kind of summarize what we've learned because we did a little exploration into the Grimm's folktales. And what I was trying to convey, which I think is really cool, is that these folktales can give us insight into what the oral tradition was at the time and what sorts of expressions and proverbs and phrases made their way into everyday speech. So I have a lot of respect for the Brothers Grimm Uh, for taking on a project this large and following through with it 
and giving a sort of legitimacy to the people that they knew, not the aristocracy, not the nobility, but the everyday folk that were around them um, and giving them a voice by capturing the stories that were that were passed around uh, from generation within these groups of people. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. It's one of the problems with an oral tradition is that before recording came about and we could have podcasts, uh, it would just disappear. And without writing like this, it would be a lot harder to access the minds and the language of these people who existed back then. And they started out on this quest to record just stories that were being told, but they ended up making some really valuable documents for lots of reasons. Yeah, and I feel like they didn't even know the impact that their stories would have on the following generations of children and adults alike. These stories are so pervasive in our society. And if they hadn't set out to document and preserve them, we never would have these stories today. So we owe a lot to the Brothers Grimm in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I feel like childhood is always tinged a little German whenever you hear any fairy tale. So it's truly amazing how much these have pervaded culture. Okay, so we're going to head to the break. When we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about the work that the Brothers Grimm did with Germanic linguistics and how it relates to the, the concept of the, the German national spirit that I was talking about earlier. We'll be back. Hey there, it's Steph. Multilinguish is brought to you by Babbel, the language app. Our marketing team wants you to know that we offer an app that teaches you 14 languages. From Spanish, French, and Italian to Portuguese, Russian, and more, Babbel's app is created by real language teachers and experts. You'll learn how to have conversations in real life situations, like frantically asking for directions in a foreign city. We're offering Multilinguish listeners 50% off a three month subscription. New customers can get this offer by visiting babbel.com slash podcast. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash podcast. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to Multilinguish. Before the break, we talked about the work of the Brothers Grimm in collecting and codifying their nation's folktales in oral traditions into a kind of masterwork that has helped embody the German spirit or zeitgeist of their era. We think so much of the work of the Brothers Grimm uh, is about fairy tales, but what I want to take the second half of this episode to touch on is what they did as linguists and language scholars, because those are just as important, and I think they're just as cool. Uh, Jakob especially, Jakob Grimm, the older brother, was trained in linguistics and language studies. That's so much of the work that he did, and we almost can't separate their work as linguists from their work collecting fairy tales because they were recording so much common speech from the people. But even more technical and scientific and linguistic of them was, um, uh, or were actually were a couple projects that we can talk about here. I think that they're super interesting. The first is uh, what's called the Deutsches Wörterbuch which means the German dictionary. So Wörterbuch would be words book, which translates to German uh, and from German to dictionary in English. So this was a project that has now grown to become the largest and most extensive German dictionary ever to exist. It started out in the late 1830s, early 1840s, when the brothers got offered the chance by the monarchy of Prussia, which was a nation state of this fractured Germany that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the bigger ones, to compile the first ever German dictionary. So it ended up becoming a huge undertaking. I think the brothers assumed it would take about 10 years and that they would finish their entire work within this time frame, but they actually didn't finish nearly what they thought they would. Um, they ended up, the last word in their entry before they finished the work was Frucht, which means fruit in German which actually might be a metaphor for how much work they put into it, you know, the fruits of their labor. Um, but this, they're also working on so many other publications at the time. By the time they died, Jacob had worked, or Jakob, I'm sorry, had worked on 21 um, other publications, 14 for Wilhelm and eight between the both of them. So this is something that's going on simultaneously with their other works, but it's definitely one of their most famous outside of uh, Kinder und Hausmärchen. So this is, when we think of a dictionary, we think of words and definitions, but this 
project was filled with more than just words and and their meanings. It was also filled with folk songs, myths, legends, children's games, proverbs, epic poetry, and of course, thousands and thousands of words. Today, um, the the latest editions of the dictionary, which is mostly complete, was was completed by uh, language scholars at different universities for the hundred some years after the the Grimms died. They have compiled more than 330,000 entries in this dictionary. So this is a massive, massive project. It's a work of historical linguistics too. So it records developments in the German language from the year 1450 onwards um, and from authors like Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation um, to everyone who followed who had some sort of influence on German language and, and culture and literature. Um, it include loan words, etymologies, synonyms, regional variations. So this is a really, really comprehensive, in-depth work. Like I said, they never finished it, but this became one of the founding Germanic linguistic masterpieces for people who wanted to study the German language and nothing had ever been done like this before. It's giving a lot of legitimacy to the idea that German is a language worth studying and worth documenting because no one, like I said, ever thought to do a project like this before. So in much the same way that Noah Webster's American Dictionary, the first American Dictionary, was kind of an exercise in fostering a national spirit, the German Dictionary of the Grimm Brothers can be thought of as doing the same thing, giving the German language some sort of framework that was the idea that the German language deserved to be preserved and looked at technically and scientifically and traced back through its history um, to map where it had been, where it was in the day, and where it could potentially go. So Thomas, um, I know that you love the dictionary. It's one of your favorite books. And what do you think about this project? What do you think it would have been like at the time to undertake a project as massive as this? I just think it's mind blowing that there was a time when like one or two people would just be like, I think we can make the dictionary from scratch because it's such a monumental undertaking. And it's just the fact that they got as far as they did is incredible. And you have to also just remember like they didn't really have like formal linguistic training at all and that's because linguistics as a topic didn't really exist back then like, as people have thought about language since pretty much the origin of, of language like people have had some thoughts of it but when you think of like modern linguistics and the practice of oh words are added to the dictionary because people have to go out and see how people are using the words to craft these definitions and they were doing that almost before anyone else was doing that and so we credit all of these 20th century linguists with inventing a field. But really, you got to hand it to the Grimm brothers for creating a whole field of study that they really just thought they were going to be doing some fairy tales about. Yeah, that's a great point. And I also think of the fact that we take dictionaries for granted if we ever need to know what a word means or where it came from. We just consult our, our dictionary, whether it's online or a physical copy we have with us. But someone had to put that together. And for every language that has a dictionary, I imagine at this point in time, most widely spoken languages do. It's it's a work that took so much intentionality and effort and someone is having to consult the people around them and say, oh, well, to you, to this group of people, this word means this, but if you go to the neighboring community, it means this. And how did it evolve to have this meaning from its earlier meaning? And that's a lot of work. You got to talk to a lot of people. You got to read a lot of documents. And I just think it's it's so cool, um, but also sounds so exhausting to put together an entire dictionary. So um, it was probably one of the most important things that could have been done for the German language at the time. Um, and they just happened to be the ones who wanted to do it. So mad props to them. Yeah. And it's such a great reminder about how alive language really is because when you don't have dictionaries that are around you like we do today, like you just learned language from the people around you. You couldn't look things up. You just had to trust the person who you were with. Your parents had to tell you what words meant. It's such a different 
mindset about language that it's hard to even wrap your head around now. Yeah, it provides us a sort of universal standard instead of relying on on authority figures that we trust to say this means this or we interpret the world this way, we can instead consult we all can consult the same document or same standards much like we have many of the same laws that govern us in the same nations. Uh, we're all kind of now playing by the same rules. So it's an interesting, yeah, it's like an experiment in how do we understand each other and how will that change over time? Well, one other project that I'd like to mention is what's called the Deutsche Grammatik or the German grammar. So when we think of a grammar, a lot of people think of a, a book that contains a set of rules for how language should be spoken. And that's something you might learn in grade school. And while that's all well and good, and it helps us be better writers and better speakers to know how grammar works, linguists will be the first people to tell you, and I'm sure Thomas, you can comment on this, that a lot of the work in linguistics is better suited to be descriptivist, which means describing how language is actually used by real people, rather than prescriptivist, which is how language should be used, but might not actually be used um, out in the field when you're studying uh, conversations between actual speakers. So Jakob understood this really well, and he was the, the one who decided to kind of create this work, his grammar, his grammatic, that described how the German language was being used. And inside this work, he also was able to talk about... Um, the historical evolution of German and trace it back to what a lot of linguists call Proto-Indo-European. This is a, a language that is thought to have existed that predated a lot of modern languages um, that are in the same families or groups of families today. So Proto-Indo-European is thought to have given rise to the Indo-European group of language families, which includes ancient languages like Greek, ancient Greek and Latin, but also um, Germanic languages like English and German. So this is important to note because I talked about the encroachment of French language and culture into the German states at the time. Um because French was so closely related to Latin, French is a Romance language, and Romance languages evolved from the vulgar Latin or the common Latin that was spoken in the Roman Empire. A lot of people thought, oh, French is so connected to Latin that French is, is the classier language. It is the posher language. It is the superior language, whereas German and other Germanic languages are brutish and they're less pure and this was a misconception that Jakob Grimm was actually able to dispel for the most part in his Deutsches Grammatik, because he was able to, to paint a, um, or kind of create a thread from Germanic languages like German back to this Proto-Indo-European, which predated Greek and Latin and gave rise to Greek, Latin, but also German. So by connecting the German that he and his um, fellow countrymen spoke back to Proto-Indo-European, he was saying German is just as legitimate as French is. French might be connected to Latin more directly, but they all come from the same source, and that's Proto-Indo-European. So Thomas, knowing what you know about linguistics, I mean, I personally don't think it's fair to say that one language is superior to another, but what do you think that that this exercise um, kind of shows about people's perceptions of language. And did you happen to know that uh, about this, the language branches coming from Proto-Indo-European and, and what that means? I definitely heard about Proto-Indo-European for quite a while. And I should also just mention to head off, I also think there's no such thing as a language that's better than any others. And the thing about when you just hear about Proto-Indo-European without any context, you kind of think like, well, of course this was a language, it makes sense. They all came back from a root. But at the time when the Grimms are working, like that is not common knowledge at all. Because if you go back further than where written language can take you, like there's no written record of how did a language evolve. Like Latin just kind of appears out of nowhere if you can't trace it back. 
And so the thing that's so shocking about what the Grimms were able to do is just create this idea that like, oh, you can figure out connections in the past based on what we have today, which is, I want to convey how mind-blowing that is. And the fact it's the Grimm brothers, it's like when you find out that Oscar Isaac had a ska band before he was an actor, and you're just like, wow. Oh my gosh. Two things. But it'd be like if Oscar Isaac ska band were one of the best ska bands in the world, because that's how impressive these two feats are. Obviously, we think a lot less about Proto-Indo-European on a day-to-day basis, and Walt Disney didn't make a movie about it, but like they were able to invent the ways we're able to study languages before there were written languages. Yeah, that's why I love talking about these guys. The Brothers Grimm, they dabble in so many different areas, but they're all kind of connected. If you think about it, collecting folktales is helping to foster a sense of national identity based on the language and the stories that people are sharing. But then they're also doing very technical work, like I said, to kind of elevate German and study German and make it legitimate in the eyes of scholars and the people who speak it and say, our language has its own rich history behind it. And it's worthy of being studied. And it's worthy of, of exploring because it's, it has changed so much up to this point, it's going to continue to change. And I think that that does so much for for the collective national spirit of a people who speak that language that I it's just so mind blowing to me that they um, could do so much to bolster the way a language was perceived. Um, I'm, I just have a lot of respect for these guys. So Thomas, what do you have to say about the brothers Grimm at the end of this episode? Is there something new that you learned or something that was reinforced for you about them? Yeah, you definitely taught me a lot, basically just about the connections between all of their work, because I think in my mind, there was kind of a, there's the fairy tale folklore side of them. And then there's the linguistic and sciencey side of them, but there's not really that hard divide. And it's also kind of like, there's not a hard divide between language science and like the language that we use for art, if that makes sense. I just think they're so intrinsically tied together and they couldn't have done the linguistics work if they weren't doing the fairy tales at the same time. And it's just a fascinating way for science to happen. I'm right there with you on that. I think it's a lot harder than we think to separate linguistic science from the the study of whether it's sociology and anthropology and the study of how humans relate to each other um, or just the stories that they tell one another, which I think is very much tied up with folk sociology and anthropology. We're seeing a lot of overlap between these two these two fields of study. And I think that the Grimm's are a perfect example of how language is very much tied up into everything. The way we communicate is based heavily on language. And so when our language changes, how do we document that? How do we preserve it? How do we map it? And how do we lend it some legitimacy to carry us into the future um, and build a sort of national spirit that otherwise wouldn't exist? So I think that's the takeaway from this episode that I wanted to convey. And I hope that our listeners learn something really cool or new in the course of this episode too. But I will end it there. And I just want to say thank you so much, Thomas, for joining me. It was great to have you today. And you offered some really great uh, insights and feedback. Thanks for having me. Multilinguish is a production of the language app Babbel. This episode was produced by me, David Duchin, with help from Thomas Devlin. Editing and sound design was done by Brian Rosado. Special thanks to Karina Inditska. You can read about today's episode topic and more on Babbel Magazine. Just visit B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash magazine. Say hi on social media by finding us at Babbel USA. Finally, please rate and review this podcast. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let's just get back to it then. Boop, 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 boop. New song. Okay. Did you just mute yourself? Oh, I I said go ahead. I hit the mute button before I said go ahead.
So. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead in three, two, 